Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to introduce you today to uh, Steve Koltai, who's uh, one of our, our new friends here at, at CRDC. Um, we, have, uh, we have an interest in, uh, in, um, in business and conflict resolution that we, that's emerged in, in uh, recent, recent years of our work in, in sustainable peace building and conflict resolution in, in conflict regions. So we have a, a program that we've developed on pro, a program on business and conflict resolution. And in fact, um, we have two, two folks here who are uh, on the advisory board now, Ofer and Howard, uh, and uh, welcome you especially um, to, to this uh, newly developing uh, program. And, um, and then there are other folks that in the audience that are uh, students, former students or alumni, and then workers at CRDC. We have, uh, we have uh, Aziz Abusaro, who's a co-executive director, how I think you met, have you met yet? Did we? No, oh, you haven't met. <laughs> I, I just confusing meetings. But this is Aziz Obasaro, who is executive director and also uh, co-owner with me of Mejdi. And and then we have uh, um, uh, Alex, who's the uh, manager of CRDC, office manager. And Sahar is the director of Iran programs at CRDC. And Fakhira is is uh, is uh, is working on outreach from CRDC. Is uh, and there's, there's all sorts of cultures here. There's Israeli, Palestinian, there's Iranian, uh, there's uh, Syrian uh, program officer, Syrian uh, Nusha Kabawad. Um, so we have a, a great deal of uh, international diversity here, and and very much an interest in entrepreneurial approaches to uh, and new 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 approaches that are sustainable. In places, in in complicated places in the world, and that's where your expertise and wealth of experience is going to come in here. That we we, we want to learn from. So I want to um, uh, leave it to you now to just introduce some of the slides and some of your own, and then we'll do a Q and A, and we'll open it up to the group. Great, great. Well, I was very excited when I when I met Mark through a old old friend of mine um, at the State Department, a, a friend of long standing. I guess how you're supposed to say that. But um, let me just uh, give a, a little bit of quick um, background. Um, I um, uh, have a checkered past um, and uh, joined the State Department about uh, two and a half years ago, at the beginning of the uh, current, current administration. Uh, and I'm, I'm, most, I'm a business guy. I'm mostly an entrepreneur um, with the background in uh, uh, the entertainment industry. Um, sp I spent uh, most of my career at the in the entertainment industry. I was at Warner Brothers for almost 10 years. Um, I was head of the operating committee at Warner Brothers. Uh, I also was an entrepreneur and uh, uh, built several companies um, and uh, spent some time as a, as a consultant at a management consulting firm called McKinsey and & Company and um, as an investment banker on Wall Street and have an academic background in international affairs from Fletcher and was a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. And um, I have always felt that um, uh, one of the most important things in, um, in you know, U.S. foreign policy uh, should be, but hasn't been, the promotion of entrepreneurship. Uh, and, 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 and um, I, I believe, in, and I'm, I'm going to introduce Vanessa Holcomb as well, who worked with me on building this program at the State Department. But I have always believed that, um, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, I have one one talk I give is 97 reasons why entrepreneurship is good for you, um, and it's uh, and it and it and it really is, in my view. Um, one of the greatest bridge builders in any situation because entrepreneurs, regardless of where they come from, who they are, generally speaking, have a lot in common and generally speaking, get along and generally speaking, have things to talk about besides whatever it is that is the conflict in the communities they come from. So entrepreneurs are a certain kind of people and, and obviously what they do is they uh, create jobs, most basically. And in just about every situation, including our own, uh, jobs, and particularly jobs for young people, are very near the top of the list, if not at the top of the list, of, uh, of, of issues that contribute to political instability, 
Uh, so conversely, I believe they contribute to political stability and the growth of civil societies. And so the uh, the sort of tagline of the work I've done has has always been world peace through entrepreneurship and the role of entrepreneurship in driving that. So what I want to do is have a very short um, presentation about um, the work that uh, uh, I do and then have a conversation. When um, President, shortly after President Obama was elected, as I'm sure you all know, um, he gave this famous speech in Cairo in June of 2009, um, and uh, he talked about um, uh, changing the way the U.S. Uh, interacts with Muslim countries. And one of the um, uh, main themes of that speech was uh, to uh, help those countries who were interested develop their entrepreneurial infrastructure. And I, at the time, um, was listening to this, and I had, I'm from Los Angeles, and I had uh, sold my last company, I would retired, this was uh, probably about six years ago, and, um, uh, and, and I was very energized by this um, talk because I have, because he was saying kind of something that I have long believed in, which is that the United States should be spending a lot more time and energy imparting our experience in entrepreneurship. I mean, entrepreneurship and building businesses is, is in the DNA of America. And many people would argue of both political parties that it's, 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 it's the single biggest driver of our economy and in many ways of our whole culture because it extends to a number of things, including cultural things, entrepreneurship and, and cultural things. So when I heard the president talk about this, I was very energized and I had gotten a, 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 a fellowship that is called the Franklin Fellowship, which is a program um, that the State Department has for to bring old people um, into the State Department. And um, I came and, and started to work on this, the implementation of this speech, um, which is creating programs that actually did what the president said he wanted to have done in this speech. Now, originally it was focused on, um, you know, on, uh, um, on uh, Muslim communities, but um, my view is that you know, there's nothing specific about Muslim communities. It's just that that happened to be the topic of the moment. But uh, to me, it's it's you know, there are 97 reasons why entrepreneurship is good for you, and and these these are some of them, which um, you know, all all of you I'm sure are generally um, uh, already familiar with. Um, one of the things that I that I that I always say is that it is more than a coincidence that healthy societies that have good governance, that have, you know, uh, kind of a healthy and positive civic engagement, um, that are happy societies, you know, when you, when, when, when you respond to polling. Uh, these are always places in which, um, generally speaking, uh, there is jobs, there are jobs, uh, particularly for young people, and there is kind of a a, a, a positive, affirmative, uh, optimistic view of the future. And all of those things are consistent with what an entrepreneurial ecosystem is. So they really go together very closely. And um, um, so over the course of um, the work uh, that I've done, um, I, I uh, came up with a, a, a basic model, which is um, this model that um, is really the, the, the heart of the concept of, 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 of what it is we do. And it's based on the notion that there are um, two kind of intersecting uh, circles of activity that contribute to building a successful entrepreneurial ecosystem. And those are programs and participants. The programs are six and there are six categories of participants. So I call it the six plus six model. And the six categories of programs are identify, train, connect, and sustain, fund, enable public policy, and celebrate entrepreneurs. And under each of those, there are very specific programmatic things, which we can talk about. And then there are six 
actors, six categories of players that have to be involved in this, which are corporations, foundations, NGOs, universities, investors, and government. And when you look at um, uh, uh, successful entrepreneurial ecosystems around the world, uh, and, and by the way, this is completely irrespective of level of economic development. So this is as true in Fairfax County, Virginia, as it is in Cairo. It's exactly identical. Um, you find that um, these, this six plus six model applies. And I, I often um, use the analogy in, in that in the work that we do in building entrepreneurial ecosystems, robust entrepreneurial ecosystems, that it's, it's a little bit like you know, being a doctor. Um, a doctor, you know, all doctors um, go to medical school and the biology, physiology, chemistry of every human being on earth, regardless of where they're from, is the same. Um, however, the way you treat a particular ailment probably is different with every individual, even if they're same country, same age, same gender, same everything else. There, there, are, there are always going to be differences. The same is true in doing the kind of work that you know Vanessa and I do in terms of entrepreneurship ecosystem building. It's um, uh, the basic principles are the same. So this model works whether you're in Fairfax, Virginia, or Cairo, but the particulars are very different. So the kind of program you actually have to construct, just like the the treatment regime you would construct for in in, in the case of a, of a of an illness, is different taking into account the strengths and weaknesses of that place, uh, what's available uh, nearby, and a whole bunch of other things. So, um, you know, this model um, we have deployed in several countries. As I mentioned, um, the work at the State Department has all been in Muslim countries. So it, it, uh, the three major countries in which we have worked are Egypt, Indonesia, and Turkey. Um, and uh, we have also um, done work in Lebanon, Jordan, uh, the West Bank, um, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. Um, in, 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 in rolling out this program, uh, there have been, uh, and there are, very specific things that we've learned that work and some things that don't work, and there's a whole body of of public policy literature and business literature, because this is an intersection of public policy and business. How to build a startup environment is, is really a combination of these two things. So some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with some of the kind of milestone literature in this space. For me, the kind of the, the cornerstone book is The Story of Israel, which is the um, Startup Nation book by Dan Senor and Dan Singer. Um, which talks about you know uh, the the re very very um, deliberate, very uh, successful um, example of Israel, which basically from 1985 until 2005, in the space of about 20 years, became arguably the most successful entrepreneurial ecosystem in the world, including the United States. But there are many, many other books uh, that are interesting and, and many other scholars uh, in this area. For example, um, some of you may know the work of Josh Lerner at Harvard, um, and uh, he has written a lot about this in Boulevard of Broken Dreams, which is one example of a terrific um, piece of work by him of um, what works and what doesn't in certain countries um, is, is, is something I, I, I would commend to you. But the, 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 the bottom line is that, that these six categories of activity become uh, the um, cones in which we develop programs. So I'm, I'm, and I'm just going to give you one or two examples of programs, then I'm going to stop. Um, but for, for example, in the identify category, the most obvious thing are business plan competitions, right? And, and it's, it's a great way to tease out um, who uh, is, 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 is interested to help develop skills among those who are interested in starting their own businesses. Um, and there are, that the event of the business plan competition allows for a whole bunch of things to happen around it, um, including mentoring, which of the six categories, uh, mentoring, which is in the connect and sustain uh, area, 
in, in my view, is probably the single most important element in building a successful entrepreneurial ecosystem, or for that matter, being a successful entrepreneur yourself, individually, is, is mentoring and, and finding the right mentor, and usually it's a series of mentors. Um, and there are specific programs that, you know, we know work better than others and where there's a... Um, in, in the conflict, in the, just to bring it to, to, to the, the, the topic at hand here, um, we are doing uh, some work with the U.S. Institute of Peace, um, which I'm sure um, many of you know about, um, where we're looking at, at uh, the role of entrepreneurship specifically in post-conflict states. And um, uh, as I said in the first slide, there are 97 reasons entrepreneurship is good for you, and it applies in a lot of places, but post-conflict states uh, are one that are especially interesting because um, uh, uh, there has been a, a track record of success um, and um, it is one of the things that is very positive, very forward-looking, and generally speaking, non-controversial. Um, so in tender post-conflict situations, it's one of the few things that you can do that's concrete, that really drives the bus forward and generally speaking that everyone agrees about. One of the examples we use and we have a, a, a series of blogs at the US Institute of Peace website of which the next one, is, which I hope is coming out next week, talks about Rwanda. And Rwanda is one of the countries I always use as an example of sort of what I call the poster child of success of entrepreneurship in an extreme post-conflict situation. Rwanda, as everyone knows, after 1994 was arguably one of the basket case countries of the 20th century. Um, it, it, it had, you know, it, it came out of this extraordinary genocide and you, you know, you, we all know all of the statistics. They were, it was, uh, the, the country was completely and totally flat on its back. And um, 20 years or so on, um, it has now had for 10 years the, the greatest sustained growth rate year on year per capita uh, GNP growth rate in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it has really uh, tr transformed into being in many ways a role model uh, for, for Africa having been you know, the basket case. It has also not coincidentally had the greatest increase in its World Bank doing business indicator rankings of any country in the history of the rankings, all of which, of course, led by a government decision to focus on entrepreneurship as one of the key public policy levers uh, to get past the genocide and the conflict that occurred and to move the country forward to where it is today. So it's not the only example, but it's one of the examples that I cite when we talk about entrepreneurship in a conflict, uh, post-conflict political setting uh, that, that's really successful. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. Um, I do want to introduce uh, Justin uh, Dereese just came in, who's a colleague of mine as well, as, as is Vanessa Holcomb. And um, I'm very interested uh, in, in your questions, but I'm also very interested in your stories. So I, I hope that it will be really interactive because um, Mark told me that, you know, this is a very interesting group, so an unusually interesting group. So I, I want to know if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, I mean, I'll just, I mean, I think you've given us uh, so much food for thought and there's going to be a lot of reactions. I, I'll start off with the with the reactions, I think, just to frame it in terms of our of of, uh, of our field of conflict analysis and resolution and all of the work on it, uh, maybe begin by saying that um, you know there's been very many trends and fads coming through the West on what creates success globally, and uh, you know 20, 30 years ago that was focused on, uh, on, on agribusiness and massive development in, in other kinds of sectors and there was a lot of talk about, and then there was, there was a lot on uh, deprivation versus relative deprivation and the whole question of you know, the highest to the lowest and so on. At our field, conflict analysis and resolution, looks for deep, you know, deep foundations of why conflicts persist over time and why they become very, very destructive. Because many conflicts are good. It's a good thing to have 
creative energies that are different and have different points of view, it creates creative competition. But destructive conflict is the kind where people die, basically, or people become barbarians, or, or, or people at each other's throat, and destroy their own everything that they have. And we know there are many examples of that. And Pinker's book is demonstrating along your lines, or arguing along your lines, that more trade, uh, more, more internet, inter infrastructure internationally of that trading system does create more and more uh, lower and lower levels of violence. But there's a big question, and that is the question of relative deprivation and the way in which these kind of numbers, like for example, Rwanda was the, considered the best, the poster child of international aid right up until the genocide. So it used to be that international aid was the marker of what's doing really well. Well, it turns out all the aid was going for one group and an educational system that was teaching genocide, literally. All the schools built by AID money and Western money teaching that a whole group of people were cockroaches. So money can kill things, too, and it can actually enable. So the question is, let's say in many divided societies in the world, the government, the corporations, the NGOs, the foundations are all from one ethnic group. Okay, whether it's a privileged group in Egypt or in Israel or somewhere else, where is the entrepreneurship model? How can it handle not becoming an unconscious vehicle of relative deprivation where all of those privileging processes become one ethnic group as opposed to another? So we would analyze that in terms of conflict and analysis and say that peace and justice or conflict resolution processes have to have fair wages, business from the bottom, business that has equal equality laws and equal opportunity laws. Where does that fit into your model and how well is that going to do with the multilateral agencies and how well are they going to, you know, is the World Bank really going to adjust to that? Are we wrong? Is there a simpler way to do this? And do you think the entrepreneurship model needs to uh, be tweaked based on that problem of ethnic uh, Well, Well, I mean, the first thing I want to say is, you know, I am a business guy. Right. So I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a business guy. I have 30 years of experience in business. I've built several very successful companies. Uh, I am not uh, an academic. I am not a uh, public policy expert. Um, I am very much not a development expert. Um, I have, however, observed um, USAID and the World Bank particularly. Um, and what I have um, seen is uh, a little of what you just described in the case of Rwanda, which is that um, those sorts of top-down government-to-government approaches, which is 180 degrees opposite of where I come from, because entrepreneurship is entirely bottom-up, uh, and entrepreneurs are individuals who try and make something happen, usually in opposition to the government forces around them, usually particularly in developing countries. So it's a very different paradigm. It's, it's looking at it in a very different way. My observation of the top-down approach is uh, has not been terribly positive. Uh, I, I have not um, seen you know, uh, enormous, I mean, Egypt is the first country in which um, I worked really deeply, um, have spent a lot of time there. And uh, the U.S. government arguably has spent more money in Egypt than any other single country on earth, um, uh, probably even more than Israel. And um, when you look at the effect of, I mean, depending on which numbers you use, it's somewhere between 65 and $80 billion since Camp David. When you look at the effect of that spending in Egypt um, on things like uh, youth unemployment, or for that matter, even level of education. There are some areas in which it, it was very positive. Infant mortality rates went down substantially. Uh, availability of clean drinking water went down, uh, increased substantially. But you know, by and large, from a business standpoint, on a return on investment kind of analysis, I would rather have just given everybody a check for ten thousand dollars and said, try and start your own company. Um, I, it, it, it seemed to me to be an enormous waste of resource given the result that we got. So from my standpoint, traditional development assistance, which is top-down, 
and which is very focused on, and, I, and Vanessa can attest to this because we were at the State Department together. By the way, we no longer work at the State Department, so everything I'm saying I'm able to say because I don't work there anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, one of the biggest arguments that we had with USAID in terms of trying to do this sort of work was the traditional development approach is you have to uh, improve the enabling environment before you can do any of this stuff. And I used to argue with some of my colleagues, especially in Egypt, I would say, you know, this is a perfect country in which to be having this conversation because fortunately, Egypt has a 5,000 year history. And what you're talking about in terms of improving the enabling environment is going to have to be measured with that kind of a time frame in mind based on my observations of Egypt. So if you, what you're telling me is that in 200 years, the enabling environment will be sufficient that we can start addressing the 25% official, 40% unofficial youth unemployment rate in Egypt, you're probably right. If on the other hand, you want to address that today because you think that a 25% youth unemployment rate in any country is um, inherently antithetical to political stability and civil society, which is the point of view I have, then you better start working on entrepreneurship development at the same time as you work on improving the enabling environment. And that is where the conflict uh, with traditional development models comes into place. I, I don't, for an instant, argue that the enabling environment is not important. It's crucially important. But there isn't the time in most of these places to wait and not do anything on the uh, enterprise creation side until the enabling environment is ready. You have to do both at the same time. And so I see this kind of work as concurrent with the other stuff. Okay, great. Um, what I'd like to do also is for, to give you a spectrum of folks that are here is, is if we could take a few questions and a few narratives of where people are coming from and you can take a, little, a couple of notes and then we can have a feedback. So first Sahar and then, uh, and then you back. What's your name? Yeah. And then back. Thank you for your great uh, lecture. I'm an Iranian journalist and that's uh, at least 15, 17 years that I'm observing my country and foreign policy and international relations with other countries, especially with the U.S. That's a, in, in a direct uh, conflict. We see between Iran and the United States. Uh, I thought about uh, President Obama lecture in a speech in Cairo, and that was great. All of Muslim uh, people, and I remember all of journalists, analysts, you know, were shocked that oh, that's the point for starting something new, and you know. Uh, decreasing and reducing conflict and at least a new uh, board between Muslim uh, board and the United States. But after one year, we, we witnessed a kind of uh, distance from President Obama from this policy and this. Under any pressure or whatever that uh, uh, analysts uh, talked about that frequently, I'm not getting to that point, but for this amazing model, model I'm thinking about two problems. Uh, not from problems, two issues. One is uh, that the United States is indirectly and directly in conflict with many Muslim countries. On the other hand, we see that, for example, we see many uh, foreign pressure on Muslim countries, like sanctions in Syria, Iran, even conflict with Palestine, Iran, Syria, with the United States. So I want to know what Muslim, uh, Muslim countries you mean for this, con uh, for this model, in Middle East or in Africa? Africa is easy to get to this model, at least I think. But on the other hand, the other issue that I want to raise it's that many of these Muslim countries, like my country, or even Syria, or Palestine, or many others, that uh, 
they have domestic problems like lack of NGOs because of the closed uh, governance they have they are not free to establish NGOs or investors are under pressure of sanctions so they cannot develop their uh, trade and business so how do you analyze these two problems and these two issues regarding this model so well um, we're going to take a few at the same time and then uh, uh, do you do you, that's what what we had said um, so I, w I wanted to give him a perspective on so so you take notes on this, this is from Sar yeah and then Beth what do you want to comment yeah, I'll stand up so you can see me. I can't see you. Um, hi, I'm Beth Davey. I'm curious, um, you talked about Rwanda being a darling. Like, the darling of the day now is microfinance and this idea of if we give people small amounts of money and we pool this in ways where they're accountable to other small grassroots investors, er, not investors, entrepreneurs, then we're going to see a renaissance of entrepreneurship in a particular area. And um, through C CRDC, last year I was in Indonesia with one of our faculty members doing a critical analysis of some microfinance programs that had been implemented there. Um, and what we walked away was with the feeling that this had actually much more deeply entrenched some of the root causes of community conflict. Um, so I'm wondering if you consider, first off, if you consider microfinance an entrepreneurship program, because I know that you said in your identify component that you're looking at people's business plans and evaluating them. So that would seem to me that the microfinance is often, this is the business plan that we use. Um, but then just kind of more broadly, theoretically, I'm wondering, you know, capitalism equals peace? Like across the board, that, that's not necessarily a historical <laughs> pattern that's, that's proven itself to be true. So I, I myself started a business several, uh, five or six years ago and ended up with a few employees and did successfully. And um, So I've seen what it can be, but I've also seen a lot of the downsides and how it um, created a lot of stress and conflict in my own economic circle and for my own family. So I'm curious how that works as far as building peace. I understand your argument as far as employing people and not leading to things, but I, I also see a lot of inherent complications and risk without a lot of regulation, especially in post-conflict zones. You had the example of post-Soviet Union um, up on one of your slides, and I was thinking specifically of like the oligarchs swooping in and buying up vast swaths of natural resources and using that as new business when you know, really it was them leveraging natural resources. So I'm, I'm wondering what kind of controls there are on these entrepreneurship uh, initiatives in post-conflict settings where you don't, where you've had a collapse of central governance structures. So if we're going from a, for a bottom-up approach and we have the inherent potential for people to take advantage of that situation, how do you regulate or control for those complications where there could be huge disparities in power um, without then imposing a kind of Western framework and saying, well, we want bottom-up development, but only in this way, and, and we, the United States, or we, the UN, or we, the sponsoring government, are going to delineate what that looks like. Okay. So we have two very large questions. One, in terms of Muslim countries that are constrained internally and externally by a conflict with the United States, and how they would operate with the model, and then the basic question about capitalism and its downsides. I mean, I think, you know, to talk about Sahar's point first, um, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning of, of my comments, the the Muslim overlay to this was, to me, really accidental. It was that was the thing that what I w what I was excited about was the President of the United States talked about the power of entrepreneurship as a foreign policy tool. Okay, I could have written a great speech for him about Mexico and the importance of entrepreneurship in dealing with the descent into chaos that we are watching in Mexico. Mexico is not a Muslim country. I am from Southern California, so Mexico is very prominent in my own personal worldview. Um, I would argue that Mexico is extremely important to the foreign policy of the United States. Um, and so 
uh, and because I think entrepreneurship promotion programs are good for you wherever you are, it's one of the places that I would love to see us do this. So the Muslim peace was really kind of accidental because that is what President Obama wanted to talk about in changing the way the United States politically dealt with or was perceived by the Muslim world. And from my standpoint, it was, you know, half a loaf is better than no loaf. So the fact that that's what he was talking about, okay, I'll take it. You know, we'll, we'll start with that. And that's why I started working in Egypt, Indonesia, and Turkey. I could have just as happily worked in Mexico, Vietnam, and Ghana, but it happened to have been Muslim countries. I do think that um, there's no question, absolutely no question, and this goes back to the point I made about a doctor is a doctor, but the patient is different. Um, you know, the, the doctor is the doctor, and the anatomy of the people is exactly the same. And whether you're Iranian or, Amer or American, you have exactly the same anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and all those things. You do not have the same access to health care. You do not have the same access to the technology of health care. You certainly don't have the same other environmental factors that relate to, for example, diet and um, nutrition and housing and all of that. So there are plenty of factors within the environment that are different that you have to account for when coming up with the treatment regimen. So, you know, if you take, for example, um, neonatal care in extreme poverty, you know, sometimes, in fact, most of the time, some of the greatest advances in uh, infant mortality have been achieved by doing things which in the West or in the United States you wouldn't even dream of doing because they haven't been problems for a hundred years. But, you know, things that relate to co constant temperature control or pure clean water uh, or mosquito nets. These are things which, you know, you have to do in, in a certain environment. The same is true when dealing with certain Muslim countries. One thing I have learned in the last two and a half years is that, um, and I know this sounds silly, but I had spent no time in the Muslim world before this job, ever. I had never been to a Muslim country. For the last two and a half years, that's all I've done. Uh, I've been to Egypt 12 times, I've been to Indonesia 10 times, and I've been to Turkey seven times, um, and a whole bunch of other places in between. And what I have learned is that, surprise, surprise, they're totally different from each other. So for example, Jordan, which is in between Palestine, Syria, and Iran, has actually a very robust entrepreneurial ecosystem, probably the most robust in the Arab world, um, and has is entering the movie kind of at this point instead of at this point. That's not to say that there are not a lot of things that Iran uh, that Jordan needs to do to come to this point. There are, but they are at a different level of eco ecosystem development. So the sorts of things that I would suggest to them are very different. Um, and, and the kinds of programs that work are very different. Um, so it, to me, the, 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 the Muslim piece to this is, is, is really not very helpful in understanding a particular country. You have to look at Jordan. And then you have to look at the West Bank. And by the way, you would think that Jordan and the West Bank are very similar because 85% of Jordanians are Palestinian ethnically. They're not. The ecosystem is totally different. Uh, the level of university education is totally different. The availability, uh, the porousness to the outside, needless to say, is totally different. So even though it's actually the same people, but in two different you know, adjacent geographies, they actually require very different solutions. So I think that's, that's, that's just one, one big point I would make. On, you know, Beth's point about microfinance, this is a really important point and it comes up all the time. Um, and, and it also relates to your question about sort of capitalism not equaling peace. I'm a business guy, not a politician. Mm -hmm. So I shy away from terms like capitalism and socialism and I favor terms like jobs. Um, to me, jobs, the creation of jobs, is the single most important reason why promoting entrepreneurship is necessary. Whether you look at the United States, or whether you look at a middle-income country like Turkey, or whether you look at a low-income country like Rwanda, 
Um, they are, they all, what's the biggest political issue in the United States today? Jobs. What's the biggest political issue in Tunisia today? Jobs. What's the biggest political issue today in India? Jobs. Generally speaking, with some very few exceptions, and the exceptions tend to be countries that are in what I would call demographic distress, like Japan. Um, but generally speaking, jobs and job creation is either the most important political issue or one of the two or three most poli important political issues in any country. And to me, that's irrespective of whether they have a capitalist or a socialist or a hybrid uh, method, uh, form of government. Um, so. It, the importance of, of entrepreneurship in job creation is, is absolutely irrefutable, undeniable, documented, you know. Now, that also relates to why I am less in favor or less a fan of microfinance. Microfinance, generally speaking, has, has, has not provided significant job creation. It usually provides a significant improvement for the one or two people, and, and, and maybe you can speak to this from your own experience in Indonesia, but it doesn't tend to create 20, 30, 50, 200 jobs. And so, um, therefore, it's not scalable. And, and so, um, I, I, I see it as an important activity, but not a replacement for um, real scalable entrepreneurship promotion. Thank you for clarifying where that's been conceptually for you. That's great. Yes, sir. Um, I'm not from Rwanda, but I just want to take you back to Rwanda. So how many jobs were created in Rwanda? It's, it's, it's said that, uh, that, uh, that Rwanda is the role model for entrepreneurship. And why is it that most of the Rwandese are still living outside their country as refugees? So if so, if Rwanda is doing well in terms of entrepreneurship, then most of them living outside should come back to their country and help to develop the country. So the question, the, the question is that most of the Rwandese are still living outside as refugees and shouldn't be so. Well, you know, um, it, there, you don't flip a light switch and have the entire situation change from one minute to the next. That's number one. What you do find is that the flow of of emigration slows. Uh, and the diaspora does begin to come back, and this is true, by the way, in every example. Um, I'm, I'm sure, you, you know, because we're all in the United States, we've all been following um, some of the, the Pew information about Mexico and the change in migration in Mexico. In California, because I'm a Californian, it, it's particularly pronounced because uh, for the first year since Mexico did not own California, um, there was uh, no net increase in Mexican immigration to California. In fact, there was a net decrease. And part of that was because as bad as things are in Mexico, things were worse in California. So generally speaking, people tend to move where economic conditions are better. It's, that, that's generally true. They don't turn better overnight, and those are not the only conditions. And unfortunately, in the case of Rwanda, you know, Rwanda had uh, a level of, of intercommunal ethnic violence that was, that will go down in history books as legendary. I mean, there are relatively few examples, thank God, in the 20th century. There are, there are some others, absolutely. But Rwanda is at the very extreme end of inter-ethnic conflict. And it takes a long time for people to get over that and for people to no longer be afraid. So I think um, it is a gradual change. But it is absolutely undeniable. And in fact, one of the interesting things, and I don't have these statistics at my fingertips, so I apologize, but if you look at Burundi and Rwanda, which are very unusually comparable countries. There aren't many examples where you have two countries right next to each other of approximately the same size, of approximately the same resource endowment or lack thereof. If you look at what has happened um, uh, 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 in terms of demographic trends in those two countries, uh, in, in, you know, Rwanda has, has had a curve like this and Burundi has had a curve kind of like this. So. Um, in, you know, in business, we always say you want to be up and to the right. Um, that's, that's kind of what Rwanda has looked like um, and, uh, and I think is, is, is 
over time going to result in less out migration and more return of the diaspora, but not overnight, I think. So, so I guess a, a consistent, some, some pattern in the questions and the answers is that, is that jobs, and let's, let's get away from capitalism, let's even get away from entrepreneurship, jobs do have a significant impact on global trends of stability, but there are many exceptions in terms of peculiar circumstances, like what, whether you're part of the global economy and not based on sanctions, like whether your domestic environment is repressing the possibility of NGOs and, and better government oversight or entrepreneurship, um, or whether the particular ethnic group that's not doing well or that's out of the country is due to a genocide. So, I mean, there are many factors that... No, no question. So, so, I think that, I mean, for my interest in terms of business and conflict resolution would be, well, let me put it a different way. We operate in the circumstances where people are saying the model just doesn't work. In other words, I'm interested in how you can take this model and tweak it for difficult circumstances where many of those elements are not, are not pertaining very well, like what you said about access in Palestine, or what, what Sahar was talking about in terms of sanctions. Can you do anything anyways? Are there models, and I think it requires further research, of how to approximate the model, even with bad things, making it that model difficult? Well, I think that's, I mean, I think you make two really important points. One is that, that it, 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 as with everything, it's not black and white. Entrepreneurship in and of itself is, 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 has many other factors affecting it and its ability to be successful. I'm simply saying that raising it to the level of a public policy priority already substantially improves and advances the conversation. Because once, you know, it's, it's sort of like if you don't call it out and you don't identify it as one of your priorities, you're certainly not going to get to it. So, so one thing that, that I argue for is making it, calling it out and making it a priority. In play, I mean, Iran is a perfect example, although, you know, I Iran is, it has a whole bunch of other, you know, issues, but the ability of external forces, especially the United States, to affect what goes on in Iran is basically none. That's not to say, and, and it is particularly true in Iran, Iran has a substantial youth unemployment demographic problem. And it's not just unemployment, but it's also underemployment, because Iran happens to have very strong universities, which means you have to have not just jobs, but certain kinds of jobs that you continue to create. And um, uh, I don't think that the United States is in any position to be able to help Iran, but I certainly believe that whether they admit it or not, the powers that be in Iran are going to have to deal with this issue, because jobs is always a driver of internal politics. That's what the whole Arab Spring, frankly, was about, if we recall. I mean, that's how it started. It started with the un underemployment of Bouazizi yeah. in, in Tunisia and his frustration. And that story, and so often these stories are great because they really, you can really e expand from them, that, that story is the story of an awful lot of people in a lot of places, including Iran. So I think that that um, uh, you know, there are a, a multitude of factors, and regardless of whether the, the, the regime in Iran calls it out as promoting entrepreneurship or not, one way or another, job creation, I cannot imagine, is not high on the agenda of their priorities. Aziz. Well, Egypt is also another example, because Egypt is going through a lot of turmoils now, so I was trying to understand how you applied this model in Egypt because you have an absence of policy making at the moment. There's no real parliament. There's no way to change rules or make rules. There's no police, uh, which I assume is important for safety for entrepreneurship projects. So how, how did you manage to do anything there? And is there any examples? Um, also, in poorer community, again, like Egypt, um, where half of the community live in less than a euro a day, so who, who are these people who start these projects? Um, is it richer, uh, poorer? Is there financial, you work with NGOs or foundations to give grants to some of these people? Well, so Egypt, you know, is, is uh, in many ways kind of my, my, my favorite child 
in terms of the program because it's the first country I worked in. I've spent the most time there, um, and I had never been there before. So it's, it's, it, it has been a, a full cycle for me. Um, and as with every one of these countries, you know, Egypt has some very unique assets and some very unique liabilities. Its biggest asset is, in my view, the people. Um, uh, in all of the work that I've done around the world, and there are at this point probably thousands of young entrepreneurs that I have interacted with, mostly in Egypt, Indonesia, and Turkey, but in other countries as well, all the ones I mentioned. Egypt probably has, um, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which is a, a worldwide index that's done by Babson College and looks at you know, 50 some odd countries. Um, Egypt, Egypt has, um, a, 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 when you look at a lot of these, these uh, studies, Egypt has very high rates of, in, of inherent, um, innate uh, entrepreneurship energy. And, um, uh, and I have witnessed that firsthand all over the country. Interestingly, you know, it, it, and I've traveled all over the country. It, it, obviously, you know, Egypt, you know, a third of the population or 25% of the population lives, lives in Cairo. But um, if you go to Upper Egypt, I was in Asyut. Um, if you go to, you know, Port Said, there are, there are a whole bunch of places outside of Cairo where, where you also see this. Now, uh, Vanessa especially has heard me say this, you know, I believe that entrepreneurs are like crabgrass in the summer. For those of you who are not American, you may not know what that is, but crabgrass is what grows between the sidewalk where there are cracks, and usually it's really scraggly, and when it's really hot, like in Virginia, um, in the summer, by August, there is crabgrass that's kind of squeezed up through the cracks and along the side of the building and made its way up through the, the cement. Entrepreneurs are like that. Entrepreneurs are going to exist everywhere. No matter what the culture, no matter how bad it is, no matter how bad the corruption is, no matter how repressed they are, they will exist. The key will be to what extent do you lift up the concrete, um, give them some room, some air, some water, some fertilizer, and turn it into a vegetable garden instead of crabgrass? You will have something green growing no matter what, but it could be something really nice or it could be something really scraggly. And what I've observed in Egypt is that there's a lot of crabgrass there. There are entrepreneurs in every aspect of the country, and there are a few people who have really prospered. And the people who won our business plan competition, the Global Entrepreneurship Program, one of the things we do is we run these massive nationwide, very high profile business plan competitions with a lot of press and a lot of, of fanfare. Of all of the ones we've done, I just finished one in Turkey this last weekend, um, uh, which was a nationwide thing. And we took 15 American venture investors and rock star entrepreneurs to Turkey to listen to these pitches. It was very cool, very exciting. Of all of the ones I've done all over the world, probably the most exciting one was in Egypt. Um, and the people who won that um, competition, I am still friends with. I actually mentor this company. It's two brothers, um, uh, the El Fadil brothers. They're from Alexandria. Um, they're now 24 and 22. When I met them, they were 21 and 23, um, and they uh, came up with a search engine that is a voice-activated um, iPhone um, uh, and Android uh, platform that allows for voice-activated complex search. Um, so tell me the best Italian restaurant in Washington, D.C. that is medium price, that has room for two people tonight at 7.30, and that is downtown. So I can, I can ask a complicated inquiry and get an answer, and in their case, in four languages. Um, now, one of these kids went to university. One of them didn't. They are middle class kids. They are not poor kids, but they are not rich kids. Um, they went to Alex the one who went to university went to Alexandria University, and, and, and obviously they're brilliant. Um, and, and based on 
the availability of what was in the ether on the internet and, and a lot of self-education, they came up with a product which, and they won our competition. There were 120 companies competing. They won our competition. One of the people in that particular delegation was the head of search at Google who invested in the company uh, during the course of that trip right away. And, and it was an example to me, a very exciting example to me, of how you find this diamond in the rough in a place where they had none of the, you know, there was no University Avenue in Palo Alto, Starbucks, that you could go and hang out at and listen to cool ideas. There were no VCs that were, that you could go and pitch. There was no meetup like there is in Washington, D.C., three times a week where mobile app developers can go and hang out with each other and share ideas. You know, there was none of this stuff. They didn't even have air conditioning in the room in which they had their computers. But they came up with this incredible thing. And I just have found that to be uh, inspiring even to this day. And, and I, I met them two and a half years ago. So, um, so you know, Egypt, you know, I, 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 I am extremely optimistic about the youth of Egypt. I'm not so optimistic about the political class in Egypt, especially not today. Um, and every time something like what happened today happens, you know, I get kind of a, a, a pit in my stomach. Um, but uh, I really do believe that kids like these, you know, Ashraf El Fadil, um, uh, will in the in the long run um, win because they'll either stay there and, and change their country or they'll leave. Do you, know, do you know what he's referring to about what happened today in Egypt? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do. The parliament, the... The Supreme Court uh, uh, dissolved the parliament two days before the, election. the presidential election, causing yet another chaos. Supreme Court appointed by Mubarak. They were mostly Mubarak appointees, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the whole judiciary system. Right. Okay, so um, feeling the energy, I think that's a, a good introduction and waiting of our appetites for more debate and conversation about this topic. Um, any last thoughts or comments from anybody? Yes, so okay. final uh, question. The, the tail end of the Elvis Jesus question was talking about money. So where is, where is funding coming from? Where is money coming from? And what's the U.S.'s role in pushing money in other than you know, Google's executive coming in. Um, one of the blog posts that we have coming out in this USIP series is called Invest, Don't Donate. So I don't believe in, um, in, in uh, handouts as a way to develop uh, real business skills in entrepreneurs. I believe one of the most successful um, entrepreneurs that I've um, ever worked with is a, is a Ghanaian who, who, is, who is the most successful sub-Saharan African entrepreneur whose business is solely confined to sub-Saharan Africa, in other words, which is not an extractive industry exporting raw materials. And, you know, he, 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 he made the point to me, um, Aloy Chife is his name, and he made the point to me that, um, you know, his view, he's Nigerian who works in Ghana because Nigeria is so corrupt that you can't work there, so he was in Ghana. And, and his, his, his view is that, that um, you know, aid, uh, development assistance, is like heroin. It's addictive, and it uh, destroys lives. And he believes that when you give people uh, in an entrepreneurial setting. This is not true when you're talking about humanitarian assistance. It's not true about disaster relief. We're talking about as a way to build entrepreneurship. When you give people uh, money instead of having them justify an investment, uh, then you actually are doing them a disservice. So I do not believe in um, in forced investment. I believe in earned investment. and. Uh, 
so that, that, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, one of the things, and, and you know, Vanessa and Justin have heard me say this many times, one of the great misconceptions in the, in the world about startups is that you have to have venture capital in order to have a startup industry. In the United States, less than 7% of all startups ever receive venture capital funding from the time they are born to the time they go public. Less than 7%. Um, I've, I've had several startups. My last company that I raised $38 million for never had venture capital funding at all. And I raised $38 million in three rounds of financing. Venture capital has become a, a kind of a myth uh, that people have gravitated towards thinking that that is what is the essential lubricant to uh, allow you to finance and build your company. It's not true. And it's not true in Fairfax, Virginia, nor is it true in Alexandria, Egypt. What is true is that you have to have some source of seed capital. And one of the things that we try to do, one of the programming things that we do in the fund category is try and help build angel investor networks. Um, in the United States today, there are about 350 angel investor groups who are members of the Angel Capital Association of America. Those are the official groups. Metro Washington has five such chapters. Um, I'm, I'm an angel investor myself. Angels generally invest between $25,000 and $200,000 per person per transaction. And it's an entirely different way of generating early stage capital because not only does it provide early capital, but it also importantly provides mentoring because most people who are angels are interested in being angels because they're interested in helping build companies. So they're not just looking for an investment return, they are, they are experts in marketing or logistics or operations or human resources or whatever their particular métier is. And so they bring more to the party than just money. And angel investors can exist in every country. Uh, and in the case of Egypt, in the case of this company, um, one of the things we did was to help spur the growth of angel groups, of which there are now two, which is not 200, but it's more than none. Um, and uh, so uh, this company that I mentioned is one of six companies that received some angel funding, is also participating in a local incubator which we helped facilitate the creation of, local business incubator, um, which is part of the Connect and Sustain, sustain put, putting, helping companies be in a place where they're a little more nurtured than if they're on their own. So when you, when you, when you look at at all of those pieces, um, uh, then you know it, it tends to work better, and, and you're able to get some of these local investors to invest in local startups. And getting angel investors to start getting local people to invest in their own local businesses is really important because there's no amount of money, either that U.S. investors have or that foreign assistance has, that equals the amount of money already in these countries. In fact, in most cases, one of the problems these countries have is that there are a few very, very rich people who don't invest at all in their own startups. And we're trying to change that by showing them the returns they can generate by investing in their own startups. All right, well, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Thank you very much.